when the Spanish were besieged at Kinsale. O'Donnell, followed by O'Neill, passed south through the sleeve blooms in December 1601. The outlook for Irish freedom was optimistic, but their defeat at Kinsale was a national disaster. Coupled with the loss of Oney, it meant that the O'Moores were much weakened, approaching the Second Battle of Stradbelly, fought near the rock against Francis Cosby's brother, Richard. What happened was that Richard defeated the O'Moores uh, in the Vale of Ockenhilly, I think it's called. He was then given this enormous grant from the Barrow to Balnakill. Cosby was only one of several grantees. Some, like Piggott at Lamberton and Rathaneska, getting much better quality land to add to his holdings in Limerick and elsewhere. South of Port Leisha, leaders of the Seven Septs were forced to gather and to sign as tenants of Patrick Crosby, the double agent deemed to have given many years good service to the Crown. They signed at the now ruined Lawler's Mills, Planad. Almost 300 adult males and their families were transplanted to North Kerry. After almost 400 years had passed, the clans staged the ceremonial gathering. At the foot of the Rock of Dunamais at Ochnahaila, there was dancing and pageantry, and in keeping with the Kerry connection, commentator and broadcaster Mihal Hertig was far on tea. It's good to see them gather, getting together. As I said at the outset, the gathering of the clans with an old Irish custom, it's starting, it can only get bigger. It started outdoors and continued into the night with the inevitable siege of Ennis to the music of the all Ireland winning Quilchick Haley Band and other young members of Coltus. veteran dance teacher Maura Shanahan stepping it out. Charles Coote regularly stepped out with sword in hand. By about 1620, he had acquired lands at the foot of Sleeve Bloom, originally in the domain of Rory Quaco Moor, where he planted Mount Rath, guarded by the river. For a time the largest town in the county, it was very prosperous with cloth and iron mills and other industry. A veteran of the Battle of Kinsale, Baronet Coote was given much responsibility and in particular to guard against the possible return of the Seven Septs from Kerry. But many were back in leash in time to help burn Mount Rath in the 1641 rebellion. One of the descendants of the O'Moores, Rory O'Moore, was one of the four leaders of the Irish rebellion of 1641, which resulted in uh, and in fact helped spark off the War of the Three Kingdoms in England, Scotland and Ireland. An army was raised in England to uh, put down the Irish, but in fact they used it against the King of England instead. Treachery in England, but there was trickery in Leash at Castle Cuff. Here, Baronet Coote built his fortified mansion, named in honour of his wife's Cork family, Cuff. It was in keeping with his vast estate. It was said one could walk across Ireland without leaving Coote land at one time. Barnaby Dunn was a neighbouring Irish chieftain who had turned Protestant and had English tenants. But Daniel Dunn was still Gaelic with a trick to play. The O'Dunns arrived here with the trunk of a tree blackened out um, to resemble a cannon. They hauled it on a carriage, which uh, was drawn by six oxen. They asked the family to surrender, uh, which they did, and the castle was burned. The O'Moore castle at Bally Adams had been taken over by John Bowen, Sean Apica, John of the Pike, who lanced anyone he thought not working properly. It was threatened by Lord Castlehaven with real cannon, 
but Bowen came up with an unusual defensive tactic. He threatened to suspend his two fair daughters over the wall in chairs facing the cannon. Castlehaven recorded they were indeed very fair maidens and the castle not very valuable. It was destroyed later in the war, perhaps while the fair maidens were away. The inhabitants of Ballinakill did not fare so well. They crammed into their formidable castle. Small cannon of high quality were cast in Ballinakill ironworks, but none were to hand for either side during the five-month siege until the arrival of Preston's heavy cannon from Spain forced surrender. It was eventually destroyed by Cromwell's forces in 1650. In the outdoor swimming pool, descendants of both factions play happily in sharp contrast to the enmity caused during plantation and rebellion. It should be remembered that not all English were opposed to the Confederacy. Hartpoles, Hovenlands, Darvels and Cosbys were either Catholic or joined the rebellion after 1641. At the edge of the fort of Maryborough, Port Leisha, St. Peter's Church, which was Catholic at that time, was the scene of rancour as the Confederacy disintegrated. Rory O'Moore had tried to hold together Royalists, Old Normans and Gaelic clans. When the Confederacy signed the treaty before Charles I died, the papal legate Rinuccini celebrated mass here and excommunicated anyone accepting the treaty. Present was on Row O'Neill, whose army was camped nearby at Kilminchy, now a residential area, in view of Dunamace, which they had taken earlier. But it didn't reunite the disparate forces in the face of Oliver Cromwell, whose generals levelled Dunamis as a precaution against its further use, and that war was lost too. An old cry was, God and Our Lady be our help, and Rory O'Moore. Historian Charles Gavin Duffy wrote, For eight years the land was possessed, and the supreme authority exercised by the confederation created by O'Moore. History contains no stricter instance of the influence of an individual mind. The O'Moore name would not feature so prominently again, but Rory's daughter Anne had a son, Patrick Sarsfield, who would long be remembered for success against William of Orange at Ballyneaty, Limerick and elsewhere along the Shannon. In the end, Sarsfield brokered the Treaty of Limerick, negotiations for which are believed to have taken place at Piggots of Capard, where General Ginkle stayed while the army camped at Rosinalis. The copy of the treaty, which was kept at the house until 1960, is now in the National Museum. Sarsfield departed with the wild geese, leaving Ireland and Leash with the prospect of safely sowing crops once more, repairing towns and planting new settlements. Over the next two centuries, the settlements we know as the towns of Leash developed. Mine Raha, the homestead of the Ring Fort, was an early starter with much industry, iron being the most significant as it resulted in the deforestation of the oak woods in the vicinity. It also had a distillery, which gave the river its name, the White Horse, but it was sold to Scottish interests. It is noteworthy that the plantation town may have been the experiment on which Charles Coote and John Winthrop based their Massachusetts Bay Company and the transfer of 1,000 Puritans to America from East Anglia in the 1630s and 40s. Mount Bellic, Munchochmilic, Bogland by a river, was dominated by Quakers. They were industrious and peace-loving, they valued education and craft skills such as Mount Melick work, a unique form of lace making. Their leader, William Edmondson, had been a Cromwellian soldier who converted to preaching tolerance, freedom of religion and honest living before he came to live at nearby Rosanellis, where he is interred on land he donated for the friend's resting place in the village. When its canal and rail connections were operating, Mount Melick had surpassed Mount Rath as an industrial centre. 
the preeminent town in Leash, Little Manchester. It was the location of the first sugar beet factory on the island of Ireland, located behind what is now the Montmelic Development Association headquarters. Port Tarlington, Cool and Thudre, the nook of the tanner, was a Huguenot refuge. After the Williamite campaign, French Protestants settled in the town, which eventually had its own MP, elected by about a dozen families. They were not particularly committed to democracy or inclusivity, despite their experience of persecution. One family had been smuggled out of France in wine casks. The pianist known as the Polish Dwarf said it was like being in Paris when he gave a recital in 1795. Port Harrington was the longest-lived French-speaking community in Ireland. It may have outshone Mount Melick for the number of boarding schools. Edward Carson is probably the best-known product, a barrister and conservative politician strongly opposed to Irish independence. He founded the Ulster Volunteers. Ratsdowney, Rod Donig, the ring fort of the church, gets its name from the rat which existed near the top of the square until it was levelled, revealing thousands of human bones, but curiously, no skulls. It was levelled at the time the Protestant and Old Catholic churches were built in 1820. St. Patrick was a regular traveller through the area and is particularly linked with Dunnock Moor nearby. The corn mill at Dunnock Moor was the main employer before Perry established a brewery at what is now Dawn Meats Factory in the town, a Guinness subsidiary. There was a Protestant school in 1800, but no Catholic school until more than a century later. Here, as in other towns, it is noticeable that today people are proud of their shared heritage and commemorate those who suffered in all wars, whether on the continent in World War I, or the rebels of 1916 proclaiming Irish freedom. Queen Victoria passed through in 1849, describing it as a quaint village surrounded by hills. Stradvalley on Shradvalle, the street town, has a modest marketplace, securely covered and well ventilated. Located in a very fertile area, its flour and malting premises have been repurposed. The main churches are adjacent to a disused orphanage which operated from about 1870 after Lady Stanley, a royal relative, brought with her a large dowry on becoming Sister Mary Augustine. Coincidentally, Elizabeth O'Kelly, a French orphan who came to Dublin at three years of age, ended her days at the square, bequeathing 30 million euro to charity. She would have become familiar with the O'Higgins Monument, commemorating the county coroner and his two sons, Tom, a government minister in the 1950s, and Kevin, who was assassinated in 1927 while walking to Mass in Dublin. He had been vice president of the executive and minister for justice. Before dying, he asked that his assassins be forgiven, an act of reconciliation after the bitter civil war. Abbey Leeks, Monish Dar Leisha, the Abbey of Leash, referring to the earlier monastery at this site, then under O'Moore patronage on the banks of the Nore. A designated Irish heritage town, Abbey Leeks was a planned town laid out in the 1770s by the first Viscount de Vesey to relocate the old town from the low ground at the river near the house. Over a 200-year period, 14 schools, usually built with the assistance of the estate, served the community. One of those schools is now a heritage museum, displaying memorabilia illustrating aspects of life in Abiliques as practised in times past. Amongst the industries was high-quality carpet-making, sold at Harrods of London and Marshalls of Chicago, and fitted on the luxury liner Titanic. Incidentally, the only recorded leash victim of the Titanic tragedy was an Abbey Leakes man associated with the carpet business. The invention which made the carpet factory possible 
the latch stitch, was a patent purchased by de Vesey from its inventor Robert Flower, his neighbour at Doro. Darva o Noch, the oak plain of Eduok. It was developed by the Normans in the 1200s. The area was contested between the butlers of Ormond and the Fitzpatricks of Upper Ossery. Ormond won a battle at the bridge and succeeded in making it an administrative area of Kilkenny, altogether surrounded by leaks. It was reunited with leaks by Act of Parliament at the time of the Great Famine. While the surrounding towns may have reached their peak in earlier times, Port Leisha, the Fort of Leash, is now the most populous and most densely populated town in the Midlands, the fastest growing of the top 20 towns and cities in Ireland, taking advantage of its strategic location on the road and rail links between Dublin, Cork and Limerick. It has long outgrown the old centre which contains many interesting reminders of its historic past. Donamais Arts Centre occupies the site where Jeremiah Grant, the last highwayman, was hanged, beside the courthouse, one of the many distinctive buildings erected around the same time in the early 1800s, such as the High Security Prison, famous for the escape of James Lynch upon in 1902, which was the basis of J.M. Singh's The Playboy of the Western World. Across the road, the Maryborough Asylum, opened in 1833 to serve Leash and Offaly, was twice extended at roughly 30-year intervals. Deinstitutionalized for nearly half a century, the vast building is awaiting repurposing. The town today bears little resemblance to the Unionist beliefs of the planters who developed it in the 16 and 1700s, creating living conditions which were unbearable for the majority of the people leading to widespread rebellion. Speak to all your friends, speak to me. Insofar as it was ever a success, the plantation of the Midlands reached a peak of unionism in the 18th century. Uh, in fact, at the trials in 1796 of United Irishmen, uh, the jury wore orange ribbons, uh, which really made the people who were on trial for uh, United Irish sympathies very suspicious of getting justice, which they didn't get. Uh, the town in 1798, 400 horsemen ran out, uh, rode out of Port Leash to attack the rebels on the Carlow Ridge. Father Murphy camped in South Leash at the bustling coal mining area of Slat just three days after Vinegar Hill and by the time the horsemen arrived, Father Murphy had moved on towards his fate at Tullow. Beside the Wolpeel Chapel, which stands behind the gates of the old Carlow Jail, is the memorial of the wounded who remained, some of whom were nursed back to health and settled in the vicinity. They all didn't die. There was a, a small percentage of them were taken in by local farmers, and some of them uh, married in to the local areas. Uh, and some of those names from Wexford are still uh, in the area. Uh, there was Kyo's, there was um, uh, Hennessy's and Murphy's. Miners from Modja Bay, Slat and Wolf Hill Pits downed tools and joined Father Murphy, but it was not possible to unite Catholic, Protestant and dissenter in the way Henry Joy McCracken, son of a ship-owning Presbyterian father and Huguenot mother, had envisaged. By the time of the actual uprising, government tactics playing on old grievances caused the movement to become sectarian at times. Queen's County rebels gathered at Ballock Moiler intending to join with Carlow insurgents on May the 25th, 1798, but the bridge at Great Cullen was guarded with infantry and cannon. On returning to Ballockmoyler, they attacked Reverend Whitty's house, where a number of Protestants had taken a defensive position. 21 rebels were believed killed in the unsuccessful attack, which collapsed when they heard of the events that morning in Carlow, where up to 600 of their comrades were killed collected over the next two days by 19 carters 
and buried in sand pits. Their memory is not forgotten in Greg Cullen. Beside the French church in Port Harrington, on the monument erected in 1979, six men from the area are commemorated, four of whom were executed in the square a fortnight before the rising commenced. During the rising, 11 were hanged from the shafts of carts in Mount Melick over a three-day period in June, about a week before the Battle of Vinegar Hill. Perhaps the most poignant, a youth playing marbles nearby on the day of the first five hangings was taken and severely questioned, but having given no information, was hanged alone from the same cart on the second day. The men from Rosenallison, Mount Melick area, are buried in the Ivy Cemetery at the Old Chapel in Greig. After Father Murphy, en route to meet Bishop Delaney at Tullo, was hanged, a report from Stradbury Hall on the 28th of August noted that the colliers were in a state of tranquillity, no doubt conscious of their own families as they produced the low flame, high heat coal in great demand at that time. All the linen mills, all of that was run by steam power and our, our coal, although it was smoky, was ideal for it. With the Industrial Revolution taking place in England, Wolf Hill coal was in demand. Eventually, a special rail line was built connecting to a thigh for onward shipment, used until after the World Wars of the 20th century. I think when they cut back on the smog and all that in the 60s around the cities, Sheffield and London and all that, I think the likes of Wolf Hill got an awful battering, you know. There was over 800 at one stage uh, working in the mines in Wolf Hill. It was highly populated. And then they learnt their trade, so they did, from the mines. To the ladies in the office, they trained in the bookwork. So there was nothing else. What else would there have been, you know? For more than two centuries, coal mining was the major employer in South Leash, and its influence extended across a wider area. It was dangerous, but well paid, at least four times what farm labourers earned, but their living conditions were no better. Consoled by whisky, they were prone to violence. Eventually, another type of earth would be mined in the Wolf Hill area to develop the fire clay factory at the Swan. In the meantime, labouring work became available in the valleys below Wolf Trap Mountain in the Sleeve Blooms. Built artefacts remain on land where reclamation efforts gave rise to employment of 200 labourers at Cartown and Bonray, the Happy Valley where they grew exquisite crops of potatoes in the 1840s, using as fertiliser guano bird droppings rich in nitrogen imported from the African coast. A gold medal winner with the Royal Agricultural Society, the project was cutting edge, prosperous and modern. The first concrete built house in Leinster was here on this site, built by William Trench in what was formerly known as the Happy Valley. Some of the remnants still remain, but the house is no longer standing. The potato blight arrived, the people left, the land returned to nature. The crop abandoned, William Trench soon went on to become an agent for powerful landlords elsewhere, encouraging tenants to emigrate during the greatest calamity to befall the country when the ill-named workhouse became the only refuge for the destitute thousands dying of hunger and disease on the roadside. At the Dunnockmore Workhouse Museum, Trevor Stanley describes the wretched conditions. As a family entered the workhouse, they were always checked by a local doctor to see whether they were well or sick. If they were sick, they were removed straight away to the infirmary to the back of the workhouse. If they were well, their clothes were taken from them. They were scrubbed, scoured and separated into four distinct groups. Girls from uh, two years to 15 stayed in one building and had an access to the courtyard to the rear. Boys 
2 to 15 had access to this building here uh, and access to the courtyard at the back. Men and women were separated into two different groups and were separated purposely uh, to make things as uncomfortable for the people that were living here as possible. There was really only two methods of, of, of leaving the workhouse. One was to the graveyard to the rear or emigration. They had no mechanism built into the system to allow the families back to the land that they would have had tenement rights to before they entered. So there was no mechanism to allow them to leave the workhouse and emigration in fairness became the biggest opportunity for people to leave. The population of Leash reduced by 27%. At Cromog is buried the wandering piper, immortalised by Shanaho poet John Keegan, who recounted Quaeca Leary's return at the height of the famine. And where a Vic McCree he sobbed is all the merry making I found here twenty years ago. My tale I sighed might weary, enough to say there's none but me to welcome Quaeca Leary. Keegan himself died of cholera in 1849. Laws enacted in 1695 in breach of the Treaty of Limerick favoured the established Church of Ireland over other religions and demonised Catholicism so that Mass was celebrated in secret. Catholics were denied entry into the professions, ownership of property above a certain value, and any communication through the Gaelic language was considered to be revolt. When the worst of the penal laws were removed in 1829, Voting rights were restricted by raising the qualifying property valuation by 500%. Farmers were still obliged to pay tithes to support the Church of Ireland. Honest Pat Lawler, who farmed a large holding at Tinnock Hill, Raheen, supported Daniel O'Connell and was elected MP, losing to Tom de Vesey in the following election, when Abbey League's tenants were instructed how to vote under penalty of eviction. Lawler advocated peaceful opposition to the tides. Nobody should buy livestock confiscated in lieu of payment. When the government found it impossible to collect the tax, they altered the levy and added it to the rent collected by the landlord. It was finally abolished in 1869 when the Church of Ireland was disestablished. Pat Lawler's son, James Finton Lawler, took a more aggressive stance. He opposed the repeal of the Union movement, writing in the nation that the land question was a far more pressing concern. Ireland her own and all therein, from the sod to the sky, the soil of Ireland for the people of Ireland. His brother Richard became MP for 12 years and was a supporter of Charles Stuart Parnell. Interestingly, Parnell's great-grandfather John, who had a residence at Rat League, now covered by the motorway, had attempted to restore Dunamais. An earlier ancestor, Thomas Parnell, had been a Cromwellian supporter when it was demolished two centuries earlier. Parnells were Protestant landlords, but like many others, they opposed much of English politics since the Act of Union. In that context, it was not surprising that the Lawlers were influential in promoting nationalism in Leash and beyond. One of the first signs of nationalist revival was a great rally in the 1840s uh, at which uh, Honest Pat Lawler spoke about uh, rejecting the tides. By the 20th century, it was a firmly nationalist town. In anticipation of a county museum, Jim Fleming and his wife hold some important memorabilia from the period when 97% of farmers were tenants. Only 3% owned the land they worked. This banner was carried during the Lugacorn evictions of 1871. According to the folklore collected in the 1930s, the motivation for starting the Pay No Rent Plan of Campaign in Lugacorn was that two gentlemen farmers, William Dunn and Dennis Kilbride, had come down in the world, 
with 1,300 acres and 700 acres of fattening land, respectively. They were not the average tenant. Lord Lansdowne, the absentee landlord, was Governor of Canada. He evicted Kilbride and 31 others. The land question crystallised as an issue of conquest and home rule was championed as the political solution. Northern Unionists formed the Ulster Volunteers in opposition. In response, Nationalists formed the Irish Volunteers. The organisation was strong in Leash and at the outbreak of World War I, John Redmond, leader of the Home Rule Movement, decided to call a gathering at the Barrack Field, now the Department of Agriculture office in Portisha. His plea to fight for the Empire and the promise of Home Rule later resulted in heartbreaking stories when many joined the Leinster Regiment and lost their lives in the trenches. Their sacrifice was recalled 100 years later when Portisha branch of Coltis visited battlefields in France one of the party recalling the loss of five uncles. Redmond's message was rejected by a small minority who met in the old tin shed known as St. Patrick's Hall, later occupied by Skull Nagard, now Colosh the Dune Mask, to carry out the order signed by Padraig Pierce, incidentally the only one of its kind known to have survived. This is Padraig Pierce's order to start a rising in Leash. It's a coded order. On Good Friday in Dublin, my uncle Eamon met with Sean McDermott and he told him to go to Pierce. He went to Pierce, he gave him this order, and it reads 1916 at the top, and Q, which be headquarters. And then Balafin uh, is, the, is the code word to start the uh, rising in leash, uh, 23rd instant, uh, uh, 7 p.m. Owen McNeil, whose position as head of the volunteers had been usurped, countermanded the orders for Easter Sunday but the Leash volunteers followed their pre-arranged instructions to prevent potential reinforcements from Waterford and Kilkenny reaching Dublin by rail some hours after the rising should have begun. But as events in Dublin did not take place until Monday, the first shots of the rising, albeit warning shots, were fired in Leash. The men who demolished the railway were not keen to be captured and the local authorities didn't want to admit revolt, so the action was played down in reports. But the raids on RIC barracks across the county could not be denied during the War of Independence. Munster men were once expelled from Ballylairoc, but they were welcome during the struggle and the flying column had a safe refuge on the leash side of the border. Michael Collins decided sometime in 1921 to uh, set up the IRA on a divisional status. And the 3rd Southern Division was set up and that covered Leash Offaly and North West Tipperary. Their headquarters was here. And we have actually a photograph of Jack Collison, Sean Gaynor and McCurtain uh, taken here in the parlour. Sadly, the departure of the English army was followed by a civil war memories of which are fading with time, pageantry replacing old realities. Ironically, some of the most iconic stately homes from the Anglo-Irish period survived the changes of the 20th century in the custodianship of Catholic monastics. The Gardens of Haywood, designed by Edwin Lutyens and Gertrude Jekyll, were maintained for a time by the Salesian Order, prior to it becoming the property of the nation. 
William Trench arrived with other Huguenots from France in the aftermath of the war between King James and his nephew, King William of Orange. The mansion was built in 1746 by Michael Frederick Trench, whose mother was Anne Moore of Cremorgan. Windows from Ahabo Abbey were repurposed here to create the imagery of an ancient ruin. The house was lost to fire in 1950 while acting as a boarding school, but the stately grandeur of the gardens is an indication of the overall splendour which greeted Empress Elizabeth of Austria when she visited to hunt. Doro Castle, now a prime venue for wedding parties, was a convent secondary school acquired after the Flower family sold the town to the Bank of Ireland in 1922. The flowers had been in ownership since the Castellet style house was begun in 1712. Bally Finn, voted the best hotel in the world in 2016 by readers of Condé Nast Travel magazine, became a secondary school in 1930, operated by the Patrician Brothers until 2008. Regarded as one of the finest examples of early 19th century houses, its present owners, Chicago-born Fred Crevel and his Kerry-born wife Kay, had a full restoration carried out under the leadership of Jim Reynolds. Ballyfin was on Moor territory until the plantation and it became the seat of the Duke of Wellington's brother, William Wellesley. No doubt when the young Duke stayed here before setting out to challenge Napoleon, he became aware of the local hero, Fionn McCool, who learned the arts of war and hunting in this area of the sleeve blooms from Bodmill and Leah Lucre. Two years before Waterloo, Wellesley Pole sold Ballyfin to Baronet Charles Coote, who had inherited from his cousin, the last Earl of Mountrath. Coote duly attended the battle and was commended by the Iron Duke. Emo House became a Jesuit novitiate in 1930. After the Jesuits left, it was purchased by financier Colonel Charmley Harrison, who donated it to the state. The house was begun in 1790 by the first Earl of Port Arlington, but only completed 70 years later by the third Earl. The second Earl led the 18th Hussars in a preliminary battle two days before Waterloo, but celebrated too well and didn't show on the day until the final decisive cavalry charge. He resigned in disgrace. Unlike Edward Dunn, who had a castle at Britis, with a grand avenue down to his church in Clonesley village. Having purchased a commission in the army to become General Dunn, he stayed home from Waterloo, claiming his wife never told him about the order, known locally ever after as Shun the Battle Ned. Religious orders did not take over Stradbally Hall, but in 1990 work began on the first Russian Orthodox Church in Ireland dedicated in honour of St. Coleman Makalisha. In keeping with their shared heritage with Roman Catholicism, the liturgies of each are mutually recognised. The grounds are best known today as the site for steam rallies and the electric picnic, but were once attractive for hunting parties of high society, causing a large extension to be built. My great-grandfather extended the house in uh, 1868 to 1870 ready for a visit by the Prince of Wales, the future King Edward VII. But unfortunately he didn't stay, he, he went off to Granston and uh, well, the shooting was better. However, at Abbey Leaks in 1965, Princess Margaret, sister of Queen Elizabeth II, was welcomed by her in-laws, Lord and Lady de Vesey. But when a disgruntled group attempted to cut the electricity supply, the incident quickly made world news long before there was internet. Paddy Prendergast was duty officer at Abbey Leaks Garda Station. I think that was about 10 o'clock in the evening, I'm not sure about that. Uh, but evidently the power came back on, their own generator kicked in within minutes. But uh, literally within minutes I had calls from, I think it was either Toronto or Ottawa, and somewhere in the United States I had calls about it before I got anything from Dublin or London. It was quite extraordinary. Smaller houses can produce major figures too. Daniel Delaney was born at Paddock near Mount Rath, 
during the penal times. When his father, a relatively well-to-do Catholic farmer, died, his Fitzpatrick aunts in the town arranged for him to be smuggled to France and educated for the priesthood. As Bishop of Kildare and Lachlan, he was influential during Catholic emancipation. Founded the Brigidine Sisters, whose Mount Rath base was donated to the community when they ceased involvement in education, and the Patrician Brothers, who moved from Mount Rath to Ballyfin House and the Main in 1930. Change times indeed. Speak to all your friends, speak to me. 21st century personalities from across Leash are well known, inspiring followers through modern media. However he was inspired, it is a fact that Surgeon Bartholomew Moss, who was born in this house in Port Leisha, studied midwifery and established the first maternity training hospital. Would what is now the Rotunda in Dublin have come about if his father, who came to Ireland as private chaplain to William of Orange, had not been appointed rector of Maryborough after the Battle of the Boyne in 1690? By contrast, here, near Ballybritus, was the birthplace of a descendant of Robert Adair, who led a regiment for William of Orange at the Battle of the Boyne. Born in 1823, Black Jack Adair made a fortune in land dealings in Texas and was noted for evicting tenants in Leash. In 1861, his eviction of 44 tenants, including 159 children, from his Donegal estate made him one of Ireland's most hated individuals. Circumstance and opportunity resulted in a Ballylinen native becoming the first Catholic mayor of New York City. William Russell Grace was a wealthy philanthropist who sent significant aid home during the famine of 1879. While mayor of New York he received the Statue of Liberty, a gift from France in 1885. His two infant daughters are buried in Ballylinen. On the other side of the county, at Mount Rath, Philip Casey was born in this house. He also served on New York City Council alongside Russell Grace and was a member of the New York Stock Exchange. Casey, acknowledged as one of the best handballers of all time, trained world champion heavyweight John L. Sullivan for his title fight with gentleman Jim Corbett, which Sullivan lost in the 21st round. But a Port born boxer who trained in his own hometown won a world professional title in 2018. His trainer, a descendant of Paddy Ryan, the Troy Bruiser, the bare knuckle fighter Sullivan beat to win the title. We're very proud of our um, ancestors, of course, the Bruiser, the Trojan giant. Um, T.J. Dutney, of course, uh, born and reared in Portlaoise town, had a tremendous uh, amateur career representing Ireland at numerous internationals and multinations. Uh, T.J. went on, of course, in, uh, I think it was 2006, moved to Australia, turned professional, and we were delighted that he, for nearly all his big fights, he came back home to Portlaoise to, to prepare. The, the end result of all of that was that he became a uh, world super bantamweight champion. Apart from boxers and jockeys, the first paid sportsmen in Ireland may well have been some members of a cricket team when Lord Ashbrook of Doro Castle paid two shillings to Catholic labourers for practice and two shillings and sixpence per match day, plus expenses, during the Great Famine. They lined out alongside the gentry who forfeited one shilling for every match they lost. Participation in sport was limited, however, unlike today in multicultural leash. The Amateur Gaelic Athletic Association, formed with nationalistic fervour in 1884, is responding to the changes in society. So the um, GA at the moment is at its strongest ever in leash, uh, where we speak now. Uh, we've had a huge influx of new people over the last 20 years. 20 years ago, there were very few uh, people who were born outside of Ireland living in Port Leisure. At the moment we have people from 105 nationalities, they speak 48 different languages and they worship in 22 different religions. So that's been an enormous 
um, change in, in society. But Leash was always a county that adapted to change. We were the first county, along with Offaly, to be colonised or planted as we called it. So we had a history of dealing with people who came from outside. And despite the early difficulties, we coped very well with it. Traditional forms of dancing and music were the main focus of Coltus Kjoltori Ern, which came into existence in 1951. RTE broadcasting the cameras All-Ireland winning full set of the early 70s with Jimmy Hartford on the accordion. Fifty years later, the Ballyroan half set is still going strong. New arrivals continue the process of integration, proving that culture is a living tradition which continues to evolve. Folk culture, pop culture, agriculture, all find a home in Leash. The National Ploughing Championships, which is in fact the biggest outdoor event in Europe, and it attracted 300,000 people over the three days from all over Ireland and many, many visitors from overseas who still speak about the friendliness and the hospitality that they receive. The county has terrific experience in dealing with events such as this. One need only think of the Electric Picnic Festival in, in Stradbally, one of the preeminent music festivals in, in, in the world. It managed that for a number of years now, well over a decade, with extreme success and pleasure being expressed by everybody. Indeed, our catchment area within 60 minute driving distance of uh, Port Leash is around a million people. A more affluent society, perhaps, but traditional music remains strong in the home of the Bridge Kelly Band. Their members over a five decade period held in high esteem. Founder member Tom Ahern, a winner of six senior All-Ireland Kelly Band titles, had trouble borrowing the price of a fiddle, five pounds, or six euro thirty cent, when working six days a week for a farmer in 1940. I didn't get the five pound for a fortnight. Apparently the farmer got very, he was getting it very hard to get it. Money. But anyway, eventually he did give me the money and my mother went over to a and bought his fiddle. And you know, I don't think I ever cherished anything as much. A well-loved and well-used instrument. At Ballantubbert, a more affordable instrument was used by Cecil Day Lewis, the son of the vicar. He used a pen, eventually becoming Poet Laureate of Britain, bringing fame to the locality. Cecil Day Lewis hails from this part of the country. He was born in 1904 in this parish, Ballantrubert House. His father was rector here and his son, Daniel De Lewis, of my left foot fame, also occasionally comes here, pops in to say hello to make sure we're all here. So that's our claim to fame. In the church grounds is a family memorial of the inspired composer of 765 hymns preacher Thomas Kelly, who led a breakaway religious sect for half a century until his death in 1855. Patrons of the Catholic Church at Rath were Edmund Deese, MP, supporter of the Land League, and his wife, daughter of Henry Grattan. Their daughter, Charlotte, was a member of Conran and Gaelge. She helped organise Fesh Leash and Ossery in the early 1900s and was inspired to collect old prayers in Irish, Padraigan and Gael, still in print as an English translation, available from a seller in Delhi, India. Literary activity is strong in Leash, and the annual Leaves Festival celebrates local writers. Arthur Broomfield is one of those who contributes poetry. So uh, there's a vibrant scene and up, and we, we meet and we, we discuss on the internet now, mostly, and good chats. And, and, and uh, I mentor poets as well, so some of them come to me and I, uh, such is the quality of my mentoring, but I do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> the more practical-minded, pioneering motor engineers in Portlaoise 
were the first to build an aeroplane in what is now the jurisdiction of Ireland. So yeah, the Aldrich's uh, garage in Port Leash came into ex existence in the late 1800s and one of the first garages in Ireland, definitely the first guys to build and design a motor car in Ireland. And they were also involved in innovation and engineering, designing a, an underfloor heating system for a car back in the late 1800s. We know that in 1907 that they were discussing plans and patents for an aeroplane. We know that in 1909 they built a model aeroplane with two engines, little engines, and we know that it flew a considerable distance. In 1909, the same year, father and sons went to an exhibition, the first major flight display actually in the UK in Blackpool. When they came back, they started construction on the plane itself. By 1912, they had it completed beside the railway station in a big field called the Golden Croft. They took it out for a trial run. We know that the, the aeroplane took to the air because no lesser figure than Colonel James Fitzmaurice told us so in his memoirs. Buildings rise above the Golden Croft as Port Leisha continues its rapid expansion. James Fitzmaurice, who was a witness to the test flight, went on to co-pilot the first east-west crossing of the Atlantic in 1928, marked by the monument in Fitzmaurice Plaza in view of the buildings where he was educated by the Christian brothers. Fitzmaurice proudly wore his Irish Air Corps uniform at the ceremonial parade, the citation by Congress, and the first presentation to foreigners of the distinguished Flyer Cross by President Calvin Coolidge, a far cry from his ambition to drive a steam engine. As a young boy, his ambition was to drive a steam engine, as everybody at the time was. Herbie Sixsmith's father actually owned a steam engine and thrashing machine when Herbie was born in 1914 at Dunan in the south of the county. Images from deep space are possible because of his pioneering work on cryogenic refrigeration using miniature components, an essential feature of the photographic equipment on the Hubble telescope. From the first aeroplane flight to walking on the moon had taken 66 years, a faster rate of development than the bicycle. After more than a century of development, the bicycle had become the most common means of transport when the Cycle King, Al O'Donigan, was inspired to open his cycle shop in Market Square, Port Leisha. He became the first to cycle 25 miles in under one hour in a time trial on the Navan Road in 1934, an average speed of 40 kilometers per hour. Today, cycling is more often seen as a sport or recreational activity, with specialist mountain bike trails in the sleeve blooms for young and old. Kennedy offers a bit more variety. The trail here is a little more challenging. It should be, at times, for the faster guy. The guy who is very, very brave, so you get an awful lot out of it if you're seriously into mountain biking. Just be careful if you're on the, other, the higher side of 50 because some of it is quite challenging. Walking trails are also an inspirational recreational activity, attracting discerning visitors from near and far. I'm from Kilbegan in County Westmead. This is the first time I've ever visited the Glen Barrow Waterfall. I can't believe this is on our doorstep. I've never seen it before. The view is absolutely beautiful. Savi Mumu is originally from Fiji. And I've come across this uh, lovely, beautiful place here in Sleep Bloom, and uh, it is one of the best uh, views you can get in Ireland. Inspired people lived in these remote valleys and glens long ago in places like the lost village of Glen Barrow. Today's necessities inspire new inventions. What will our descendants find a hundred years from now? Never mind eight and a half thousand years hence. Will the old Irish wish be granted? On Donus Amach is on Sonus Ishtach. Out with the badness and in with the goodness. Lovely leash, I hear you calling in my dreams.
too deep.